Let's go to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12. The passage for today is verse 28 to 34. Mark 12, 28 to 34 from the ESV version. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Questions, questions, questions is all they've been coming at with Jesus, right? These religious leaders, they've been coming to Jesus, asking him question after question. But this guy is a little different. Perhaps he came initially with the intent to trap Jesus, perhaps. But by the end, you will see that he's a little more bordering on the genuine side. And he asks an important question. What is the most important commandment of all? This scribe asks Jesus this question here. That's what this passage is about. It's about Jesus' answer to this question. What is the most important commandment of all? What's the most important commandment of all? That was an important question for that scribe that day. And it's also an important question for, I think, every single human being. <laughs> That's right. See, every single human being. Why do I say this is an important question for every single human being? Not just the scribe on that day. Yeah, for the scribe, you know, the scribes were experts in the Old Testament. And they had analyzed the Old Testament to the point where they had actually listed out the commandments. And it's not ten. <laughs> According to their numbering, they studied the books of Moses, the first five books, and they listed out the commandments, and they said there are... 613 commandments, 613. Now you can imagine if you have a list of 613 commandments, then the question becomes important. What is the most important commandment? Because what if you do 600 and leave out the 13, you know? You don't want to leave out the most important. <laughs> Practically, that question became very important for the experts of Old Testament law in those days. They would discuss and debate on it, you know? This is most important, that is most important, so on and so forth. There are summaries in the Old Testament itself. And so it's an important question for the scribe that day, but it's also an important question for every single human being. Why do I say that? Maybe you'll be able to see why it's important if I can just say that same question in a different way. Let me restate that question. He said, what is the most important commandment or what is the first or the most important commandment of? Or let me restate that question in a different way. And I think you'll see why this is an important question for every single human being. I can ask the same question in this way. What is the most important obligation we have in life? It's the same question. I'm just rephrasing it, that's all. Stating it in a different way. <laughs> you compare the two questions. What is the most important commandment of all? <laughs> what is the most important obligation we have in life? We all have obligations. And we're all answerable to somebody. Right? Even the little child has obligations in the home. And then when it goes to school. <laughs> and then when the grown-up man or woman goes to work. <laughs> No matter what age, who, or what they are, they have obligations, yes. Be foolish to think we do not have obligations toward God. It would also be foolish to think that we're not answerable to God. Wouldn't it be foolish? If the child is answering to the parents in the home and the teachers in the school, and then if the adults are answering to their bosses at the workplace, and if the whole nation in a way answers to the government, and even in a democracy, the government answers to the nation, <laughs> if everybody has to answer to somebody, doesn't it simply make sense, common sense, that we all have to answer for our life before God? 
it makes common sense, I think. It would be foolish to think that, oh, you know, we answer to all these people on this earth, <laughs> in this world, <laughs> these superiors, <laughs> but then we don't answer to the one who is superior to everybody. That's the most foolish thing to think. We all have obligations to God, not just other obligations, and we all have to answer to God. And so it makes sense to know what it is that he expects from us the most. What is the number one thing he expects from us? That is an important question, if ever there was. So, let's see what Jesus' answer is. We'll split split it up like this into three. We'll see first what it is. What is this most important obligation we have in life as a whole? In life as a whole. See, this this is more important than what is your obligation in school or your work or your obligation as a husband or a wife or a child or a parent. I'm talking about something more important. Your number one obligation in life as a whole. That's the question posed here. What is it? How important is it to do it? And... Why knowing this is not enough? That's what we're going to see today. What is this most important obligation? How important is it to do it? How important it is to do it? And why knowing all this is simply not enough? (laughs) Okay, let's begin. What is Jesus' answer? What is this most important obligation? He asks, what is the most important commandment? Jesus answers, verse 29 to 31. Jesus answered, the most important is, or the first, literally the first, that means most important, is... Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's a strange thing to say. You would have expected Jesus to go right on to, you shall love the Lord your God, right? That's the most important commandment. But he says, no, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and then only he says, love God. Now, why that first line? Well, he's quoting Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. He's not saying something new. He's pulling it out of the Old Testament. He's quoting it. (laughs) And Deuteronomy 6, before it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, it says first, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. And so Jesus is quoting it. But my question is, why does Deuteronomy put it like that? (laughs) Why does Deuteronomy, instead of saying, love God, say first, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Deuteronomy puts it like that. Jesus retains those words, quotes it in full. Why? The simple reason, if I can put it simply, is this opening line gives us the reason why we should love God. The opening line gives us the reason. What is the reason we should love God? Because the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The meaning of that is, well, there's there's so much there. That words, those words are known as the Shema. Jews would utter it every day, it seems, at least once. And there's so much there. But at minimum, it means the Lord is one. There is none like him. There is no one equal to him. There is no rival to him. There is only one Lord, and it's the Lord our God. In an ancient world which believed that there are gods left and right. You know, there's a God for the sea, there's a God of the hills, there's a God of the valley, there's a God of the storm, there's the God of the, you know, war, there's the God of uh, prosperity, there's a God for everything. And in a world where people believed you got to, you know, appease all the gods just so you're safe, you know. You want to appease the sea God as well as the hill God and the valley God and every God you want to kind of keep them in your good books so that, you know, things can go well with you. So you kind of divide up your allegiance between all the different gods. In that world comes the word, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one, one. There is nobody like him. There is no rival. And that is why you love him with all your heart. There is nobody like him. He rules above all. He is above all. He is the creator. He is the redeemer. Without him, we wouldn't exist. Without him, we would perish forever. Without him, we have nothing. He is the one who gave us everything. Life, breath, talents, abilities. Everything. Of course you love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so that opening line gives us the reason. And then, of course, he goes on to utter the famous words. (laughs) 
didn't become famous until Jesus actually quoted it, did it? Love the Lord your God with all your hearts. Old Testament words, but people didn't really pay that much attention to it. But Jesus pulls it out, brings it. This is the first here. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, mind, strength. Loving God. What does that mean? What does it mean to love God? Here we come to one of the greatest concepts, let alone things to do. (laughs) Just thinking about loving God. Do you realize what is involved in that? Loving God? It's hard to describe something like that, to put it in words. It's hard to describe love itself, first of all, even on a human level, even on a worldly level. Loving God is even harder to describe. So let me try to do it like this. Let me say that loving God is more than doing many other things. Let me begin like that. Loving God is more than, everybody say more than. (laughs) It's more than other things like knowing God, obeying God, honoring God, praising God, worshiping God, loving God is more than, more than. I say that because sometimes there is a tendency to uh, simplify what loving God is and so people say, you know, loving God is obeying God. No. (laughs) Loving God is not the same as obeying God. You gotta be careful there because you'll minimize the greatness of love Loving God is not the same as uh, knowing God. Loving God is not the same as honoring God. Loving God is not the same as these other things. I say that because, uh, for example, you can obey somebody, just think common sense, right? You can obey somebody without loving them, can't you? Yeah, you can. Students in schools, they're obeying their teachers, not because they love their teachers, you know. If they don't obey, they'll face the consequences. Very simple for fear of punishment. So you can obey somebody, do what they ask you to do, but without real love for them, it's very much possible. You can know somebody without loving them also. At least know to a certain extent, right? You can, for example, if you're acquainted with somebody for 20 years, you know something about them. You know quite a bit about them, but you don't love them necessarily. You can know somebody without uh, loving them. You can even honor somebody without loving them. You can even praise somebody (laughs) without loving them. You know, there is superficial praise. There is also praise for your enemy. Sometimes we say, I don't really like that person, but this thing he did, wow, superb, you know. Because, you know, we praise even like that. You can even kind of worship without loving God. (laughs) There are many people who would say, I worship God. I worship every God there is, you know. I make sure I cover all my bases, you know, I worship, you know, wherever, whenever I come across any holy this or that, I make sure I worship. But if you ask them, do you love God? They'll say, what? That doesn't connect with them, right? Loving God is more than these things. Now let me flip it around a little bit. You can do all these things without love, but you can't love without doing all these things. You can do all these things without love, but you can't love without all these things included in love. This shows the greatness of love because, see, you can obey without loving a person, but if you really love a person, you will obey. (laughs) If you really love a person, you can't be without obeying. You can't say, oh, you know, we love each other so much, but we just never listen to what each other says, you know. Nonsense, that's not love. If you really love somebody, you will do something that they say. There will be some obedience there. The greater the love, the greater the obedience. That's why Jesus himself said, if you love me, you will do my commandments. If you love me, you will do my commandments. Because obedience can be there without love, but love cannot be there without obedience. That's the greatness of love. It includes all these other things. You can't have love, but then say there's no knowing Think about it. You can know somebody without loving them, but you can't love somebody really without knowing them. Think about it. (laughs) If you say, oh, I am just absolutely in love with this person, then I ask you, well, what do you know about them? Nothing. You don't have a clue what, (laughs) how great love is. (laughs) If you love, if there is a deep love, (laughs) there has to be a deep knowing of one another. If if you love somebody deeply and really and truly, then you know them. You know about them and you know them and you are intimate with them and so on, right? 
you can't really love somebody without knowing them you can't really love somebody without honoring them think about what i'm saying you can't really love somebody without praising them sometimes we praise the people we love too much <laughs> you can't really love somebody and if that somebody is god <laughs> you can't really love him without really worshiping him this shows the greatness of love see other things can exist without love in a sense but love if it is true love it cannot exist without these other things love includes all this <laughs> but it is more <laughs> there is something more it is not just obeying it is not just honoring it is not just praising it is not just knowing even if you put it together it's not equal to love it's more there is something extra in love it's hard for me to articulate that love is greater than these things because it includes all these other things but it has something else what is that something more <laughs> well before i try to articulate what is that something more let me read 1 corinthians 13 because paul brings this truth out in a greater way that love is greater than all these things greater than everything else you know 1 corinthians 13 he says first three verses though i speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love i am like a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal 1 Corinthians 13 that famous chapter on love if i speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love i am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal he says if i speak in all kinds of tongues even angelic tongues but if i don't have love i'm like that cymbal being played the drum cymbal without music can you imagine if there's no music right and just somebody just, you know you can be, have the best drummer even just crashing those cymbals you'll get annoyed that's the kind of sound it will make you know you know paul says it's like that if i can speak with tongues but i don't have love it's useless it's just empty sound annoying sound verse 2 though i have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and if i have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love i am nothing he's saying if i am able to prophesy and if i have amazing knowledge and understand all kind of mysteries spiritual mysteries and if i have mountain moving faith but if i don't have love i am nothing is implying that you can have these other things in a sense without <laughs> love at least theoretically is bringing that kind of logic you can have these other things but if you don't have love all these other things you have count for nothing zero value is how he puts it now we don't have time to expand on that but let's look at verse 3 if i give away all i have and if i deliver up my body to be burned these are very strong words people read it in wedding sometimes i don't know if anybody has any clue what is talking about if i give away all i have charity good works giving to the poor if i give away all i have and if i deliver up my body to be burned the greatest sacrificial act if i sacrifice myself literally physically but have not love i gain nothing just think about that verse he's saying it's possible in a sense to you know do the greatest works of charity but not have love because love is something more that you can't say love is charity you can't say love is good works yes it includes good works but it is something more there can be good works without love but there cannot be love without <laughs> good works there is something extra you know in love it includes the idea of sacrifice great love will always be ready to sacrifice but sacrifice itself is not love there is something greater <laughs> in love <laughs> if i deliver up my body to be burned but have not love it's possible to deliver up your body to be burned but have not love and if that's the case no point in the sacrifice zero value just shocking words to show that love is something greater than just sacrifice doing good works of the highest order mountain moving faith great knowledge prophetic powers speaking in all kinds of tongues 
Love is something beyond that and having all this without love amounts to nothing. I am saying that to say how great is love. There is something extra in love. What is that? Well, here is my feeble attempt to describe what is there in that extra. I really cannot, but here is a small attempt. Love is not just obeying God, honoring God, serving God, worshipping God, sacrificing, doing good works, doing the greatest acts of mercy. No, no, it includes all that, but it is something more. What is there in that something more? It is delighting in God. Can I say that? It involves delighting in God, finding joy and pleasure in God. It is admiring Him, standing in awe of Him. Like a little child does with the father. If you have children, small children, you'll know when the father comes in, sometimes the little child will run to the father. The presence of the father delights the child. The child finds pleasure in the presence of the father. The father's presence means so much joy and delight and pleasure. Like children, when you find the best of love between children and the father, you can learn a lesson about how to love this father. You can also notice that children will, you know, delight in the father and uh, go and hug the father and welcome the father. But the children will also have a kind of, uh, that kind of uh, reaction to the father also. You you know what I mean? Like they'll be in awe of the father. That's the way to put it. They are in awe of their father. You know, they think their father is the greatest, you know. Their father is the greatest this, greatest that, greatest everything, you know. I'm talking about small children, right? before they don't know that you are the greatest. They think you are the greatest. Because in their eyes, your muscles are the biggest, your you know, stature and your talents and your this, there's nobody like you. you know? And so it's this mixture of, uh, they come boldly, they hug you, but they also stand back in awe at you, you know. That's how it is with our heavenly father. We delight in him. We have an intimate relationship with him. And yet we fear him. The fear of the Lord. That's the biblical fear of the Lord. Standing in awe. As my father, you know. All this is there in love is what I'm trying to say. Also, if you can look at a husband-wife relationship and see the best love that the wife shows to the husband, maybe that you can learn a lesson or two from there. <laughs> like a wife is faithful to her husband. We are faithful to God. In that sense, we love God. We delight in Him. We find joy, pleasure, stand in awe, admire Him. Tamil <laughs> rasikarathe. You know, enjoy, yeah, that's the word, enjoy, right? Enjoy God. (laughs) Loving God surely includes enjoying God. And that is why when they were writing the Westminster Shorter Catechism and, and they said, what is the chief purpose of man? What's the number one purpose of mankind? And the answer was to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. What a statement. That's our number one goal in life is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Who talks about God like that? That's a strange way to talk about God, right? We're used to talking about people, you know, or things, you know. I enjoy this. I love ice cream. I love football. I love Messi or, you know, this, whatever. I love, enjoy, admire, adore. <laughs> I'm in awe. My mouth is open wide. (laughs) Staring at the greatness and the majesty of my God. That is all there in loving God. Surely it is there in loving God. Don't you think so? (laughs) I find pleasure in his presence. And so I don't just obey just to get something done, you know, or just check off a list. You know, as a Christian, you can obey in the wrong way. You can obey just out of fear of punishment. If I don't do this, God will punish me. If I don't do this, you know, I'll face wrong consequences, repercussions. The highest motivation for a Christian is, I'm not going to do this because my God doesn't like it. I love him. I don't want to disappoint him. I love him too much. I want to please him. Whatever he asks me to do, even stand upside down, okay, I'll stand upside down. Or at least I'll learn how to stand upside down just to please him. That's the kind of 
You see, when you love God, the obedience itself is different. It goes in a different way entirely. The praising and the singing and the word, everything becomes different if there is love for God. The greatness of love is uh, it's a glorious combination of all these things. It's a glorious combination of all these things. All these things. There is not one positive virtue left out of love. There is not one good thing missing in love. There is not one bad thing in love. There is not one good thing missing in love. It includes all of it, and yet it is something a little bit more that's even hard to put into words. It's a glorious combination of all that is good taken to its <laughs> glorious point in a sense. I'm just trying to expand on the word love because, you know, we use it so often in the world, we miss what is involved in that. Loving God surely includes all this. So therefore, don't ever minimize love, especially when it comes to loving God. Don't ever, you know, when people say, well, this thing is not in love, you got to be careful. If it's a good thing, it is in love. <laughs> so sometimes people, even Christians will say, uh, love is not a feeling. Well, yeah, it's not a feeling, but it's not mere it's duty and action alone either, is it? If I give my body to be burned and have not love, Paul said. If I sacrifice from a cold heart, it counts for nothing. So yeah, it's not a feeling. It's more than a feeling. There is action, there is duty, there is all sacrifice, there is all that involved. But good feeling is also there, isn't it? Who created my feelings? <laughs> Isn't it God? And shouldn't I have good feelings toward him? Is there nothing to feel good about him? Is he so pitiful that I have nothing to feel good about him? Who are we talking about? We're talking about the glorious God. You see, no, no. When you love him, you feel good about him sometimes. You have good feelings toward him. If somebody says, I feel nothing towards God. Yeah, I go to church. Yeah, I love him or I serve him or whatever. I, you know, I try to obey him and honor him. But I feel nothing. I would say, have you never felt anything all your life? That's not a good sign. Have you never felt anything great towards God? <laughs> Jonathan Edwards split love into, or he's not the one to do it first, I think, but they say that he talked about love in two different ways. One is the love of complacency, he called it, and the love of benevolence. That is, one love is the kind of love where you see something good in a person <laughs> and you just enjoy it and you just are enraptured by it, right? That's what he called the love of complacency. And then the other love is he called it as the love of benevolence. That is, you see nothing good in that person. You don't love them because you see anything good in them, but there is all the good within you and you simply want to do good for them even though they don't deserve it. It's two kinds of love. What's the kind of love God loves us with? <laughs> he loved us while we were yet sinners. <laughs> when we deserved nothing. When we had nothing in our account book. <laughs> Only in minus. <laughs> right? We were sinners, we were weak, we were ungodly, we were enemies of God and at that point Christ died for us, the Bible says. He loved us like that. That's the greatness of God's love. But we don't love God like that, do we? No. He, when has he ever been like that? <laughs> like we were? <laughs> Isn't there something good in him to be enraptured by him? <laughs> there is all kinds of goodness and mercy and kindness and, and power and wisdom and glory in him. If you can stand in awe in front of the Himalayas mountains, why can't you be in awe before the God who created the mountains? And if we are not in awe, then what kind of relationship do we have? With the, do we really love God? Do you see what I'm seeing? If we can't find amazing qualities to be enraptured, then that's not really loving God. God is worthy in so many ways of our love. And so, you know, I've gone probably too much into that. Let's continue. You know, love, I'm just trying to say that there is so much, that when it says, love the Lord your God, love, 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 there is so much in that that you should not miss out. And then he says, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, those words, heart, soul, mind, strength, think about that. 
I'll say a little bit about each heart in the biblical sense, in the Bible way of speaking. You see, we speak, we, the way you use heart is uh, different today. You know, we connect uh, heart with the uh, feeling, mind with thinking. We feel with our heart, we think with our minds. The Bible doesn't speak in that kind of way. You see, words are not always used in the same sense. In the biblical days, or at least in the Bible, you will find that heart is used in a more expansive way, in a wider way, in a greater way, in a deeper way. And so for example, the heart is where the thinking also comes from. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7. We would say as a man thinks in his mind. No, as a man thinks in his heart, the Bible says. <laughs> or uh, Genesis 6, 5. Every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was evil. Or 1 Kings 3, 9, where Solomon is praying for wisdom. You remember that Solomon is praying for wisdom, right? The way he prays is, give your servant an understanding heart. A what? We would say understanding mind. But the way Bible speaks, understanding heart. Uh, God answers the prayer. He says, I have given you, verse 12, a wise and an understanding heart. Heart. I'm just trying to say, don't think heart is like today, it's, it's wider. So, but what is heart in the biblical sense? I could go on to show you that not only thinking comes from the heart, also willing, choosing comes from the heart. It's the place from which you make your decisions. <laughs> it's also the place from which your desires come. It's your innermost part of your being. It's the center of your being. It's the deepest part of you from which comes your imaginations, thinking, your willing, choosing, your desiring, and also much more. For example, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. For example, all actions, good actions or bad actions, come from the heart. Good fruit or bad fruit depends on the heart. That's why Proverbs 4.23 says, keep your heart with all diligence. Out of it are the springs of life. Keep your, guard your heart because from that only everything that determines the direction of your life comes. It's like your control center. So heart is a big word, big, big word. And uh, what about soul? Soul, you know, in a simple way we can say it's not your outer person, your body, but what is inside of your inner man. Eh? I want to just keep it simple like that. So I don't think it's very helpful to go into and nuance these words and, and describe them very specifically. No, no, no. Eh? Your inner person, but there's more to soul in the Bible. There's always more than you think there is. <laughs> um, Jesus said, don't be afraid of the one who can only kill your body, but cannot kill the soul. Be afraid of the one who can kill the body and the <coughs> soul. Genesis 2, 7 says, uh, God breathed into man and he became a living soul. And it's that living soul which gives life to the body itself. Eh? That inner part of you which actually enlivens you. Eh? Your soul. Love him with your soul. Love him with your mind. Now this is an interesting word mind because it is not found in Deuteronomy 6. Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy 6 verse 5, right? But Deuteronomy 6 5 does not say mind. <laughs> it's very interesting. But Jesus adds mind purposely, it looks like. As though to make sure to say, because we associate love with heart, emoji, heart. Jesus saying, mind also, don't, don't forget that. Love God with your mind. Love God with your mind. What does that even mean? I think it means surely love God with your thoughts. <laughs> they say that on average, a person has about 20,000 passing thoughts per day. That's crazy. Do you believe that? I find it hard to believe. What are you thinking 20,000 thoughts? What am I thinking? <laughs> I think half the thoughts are probably in vain. Probably useless. At least for most people that would be the case. I think part of what it means, love the Lord your God with your mind means with your thoughts, with your imaginations. Eh? It doesn't mean just think only about him. I don't, I don't think that's the point clearly. But whatever you think, think with him as the backdrop, shall we say. <laughs> think always with him. From his point of view, maybe. 
with him as the backdrop. <laughs> Let him be the controlling element in your thoughts and your imaginations and so on. When you study him, for which you use your mind in your studies, right? When, when you study God, when you, when you learn about God, when you read his word, when you hear his word, when you try to know more about him, do you love that? Do you love knowing more about him? Do you love studying about God? There's very few students who actually study out of interest, right? Most students study to pass the exam, just get by in life. But isn't it the case that the ones who are just studying to pass only find it difficult to pass? And the ones who study out of interest don't find it difficult to pass. How many students actually study saying, well, I just get lost in this, you know. I'm using these examples to say, when you study about God, certainly if you love him, you will at least sometimes get lost. You will know the time going by. You want more and more of it. You go to his word with such keen interest. You love studying about him. Love the Lord your God with your mind, with your strength. What does that mean? Strength means power, ability, energy. I think that's a good word. Say energy. Your strength with your energy. <laughs> so love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind and strength. And then Jesus, to really push the point, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Notice the word all, right? All your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Everybody, let's say this. Love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Oh, what's the point? Don't leave anything out. Every part of your being, right? And every part to the max, Every part in its entirety, let it all be focused on him. Let it all be devoted to him. Let it all be turned towards him. Let it all long for him. Let it all take delight and pleasure in him. And do it with all the energy and the ability that you have. Do it as to the max. The point is clear and forceful. And so let's stop and think for a minute here. Have we ever loved I ask this question not only to you to myself have we ever loved anyone like this now I ask a more important question have we ever loved God like this this is the way Jesus says we should love maybe some are questioning you know is this a little too much you know sounds you know great and grandiose but is it love with all your heart soul mind strength everything every part to the max what is this you know is this too much to expect is it <laughs> is it you can say that it's too much to expect if a human being asked that of you if some human being came and said now come on you have to love me with all your heart soul mind and strength you can just say get lost you know You probably should, <laughs> if it's a human being. <laughs> but this is God. Is this too much for him? See, that is why you had that introductory line, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. Do not compare him to anyone. There is nobody like him. And so he deserves love that nobody else deserves. On a higher level, you see the world talks about loving things, loving people, but Jesus says first love God like this. Doesn't he deserve it? Isn't he worthy of this? Surely he's worthy. He's the one who gave us uh, life, <laughs> breath, talents, abilities, hands, feet. You're sitting down <laughs> because he gave you the grace. You got up this morning because he gave you the grace. <laughs> Same for me. Doesn't he deserve? Who gave you your heart? Who gave you your soul? Who gave you your mind? Who created your brilliant brain? <laughs> and more, mind. All the strength you have. He's the one who gave it all. And so is it too much for him to demand that you love him with all of it? Some people say, you know, looks like he's very needy, you know. What kind of person commands you to love them? You're right, no human being can do that. 
or we at least have to be a little sketchy we have to little be a little suspicious unless it's somebody very you know maybe there are exceptions i don't know maybe a parent can say that to a child but a human being can't really talk like but god is different that's what i'm saying you cannot compare him to anybody else and god can command us to love him and he does it only for our good he does it for our good it is not because he is a needy god <laughs> it's not like he's saying i'm so lonely you know i got nobody to love no sometimes maybe we entertain that thought that god was you know in the beginning all lonely with no one to love and then he decided to create the world and said okay come on finally i got some people to love no 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 that is not the christian god <laughs> our god is three in one father son holy spirit existing from eternity past needing nobody needing nobody when i say that's why we believe in the trinitarian god try unity <laughs> three persons one god now when you say that some people will make fun say how can it be three and one same time well <laughs> i get their point you know it's hard to get it but let me ask a counter question the god who is only one person when did he start loving where did he learn to love he started loving only when the world was made and the humans were created and then he started learning love you know little by little but our god overflowed in love and it is out of the overflow that the world was made in theology they talk about all this because within the members of the trinity they exchange perfect love to the full they don't need anybody else god doesn't need anybody else there is love to the full overflowing and for because the overflow god has got so much love that he decided to create a world and give us the overflow it's not because he needs somebody to love it's a world of difference that's why the doctrine of trinity is very important people think it has no practical relevance it is directly connected to love if god was only one person then how did he learn to love when did he start to love <laughs> there was no one to love no the one true living god three persons one god so i'm just trying to uh, you know, answer these kind of objections god commands us to love him like this even though it may sound a little too much it's for our good it's for our good you know why because there's nobody else in this whole world that can satisfy us there is nobody else in this whole world that can satisfy us and so god himself wants to leave nothing to chance no ambiguity he says here it is i'll give you my command most important command love me with all you got <laughs> why for your own good <laughs> for your own good <laughs> because if you don't you are the loser he is not the loser see people sometimes they try to love other humans like this there are people trying to love other human beings with all their heart soul mind and they will say you know this person is my life in tamil they will say you are dang engal uir right this is my life my everything they are my everything if something happens to them i am finished i say to you yes true that is why you should not keep anyone else as your everything in that kind of spot elevate them to that kind of spot you cannot keep anyone else in that spot except god nobody else is worthy to be loved like that to the max to the full every part of you to the max completely i'm not trying to put down love to other people because that's second this love belongs to god this love belongs to god if you try to give this love to any other human it will be a tragic end you'll be devastated sooner or later because either something will happen to them or their love will change with god nothing's going to happen to him his love never fails never changes so here is god's love command to love him <laughs> a loving command to love him the second love neighbor right so i was just trying to impress on you how much there is to this loving god it's so great so high yeah? 
have you ever done it? <laughs> Love neighbor is the next one, 31, verse 31. So the guy asked for only the first commandment, right? But notice Jesus doesn't stop with the first commandment. He goes on, verse 31, and says, the second is this. Well, he never asked for the second. He said, what is the first? But Jesus says, second is this, as though he doesn't want to leave this out. You know, listen to this also. The second commandment is this. You shall love your neighbor as your self. Why did he add the second here? He was not asked. He could have just stopped. Why, I think, is based on the rest of the New Testament teaching, if you stop with just saying love God, the danger is it's easy to deceive ourselves into thinking we love God. Because it's hard to measure a love for God. We humans, it's hard for us to measure that. It's uh, hard for us to be sure. It's hard for us to clearly discern that. And that's why the second command is given because only when you follow the second commandment, you are sure that you are actually following the first. <laughs> only when you love neighbor, you are sure that you are actually loving God. If there is no love for neighbor, then there probably is... Uh, a lack of love for God. 1 John 4, 20, 21. This is clear New Testament teaching. Again and again. Verse after verse in 1 John is like this. But I'll show you one sample. 1 John 4, 20. If a man says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. Very strong, right? If a man says, I love God, hates his brother, he's a... For he who loves not his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? If he did not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? So somebody saying, I love God, but hating the brother, that's simply a liar, John says. Very strong. Verse 21, and this commandment we have from him. From who? From Jesus. That he who loves God must love his brother also. <laughs> that he who loves God must love his... John remembers <laughs> Jesus' is teaching, adding the second commandment even though he was never asked. He who loves God must love his brother also. So, brother is the word used here, but Jesus says, love your neighbor. Neighbor. Who is our neighbor? <laughs> That's a question somebody asked Jesus actually. Jesus looked at a guy and said, go love your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> and he turned back and he asked Jesus, but who is my neighbor, Jesus? The question was asked in Mark 10, 29. And in response to the question only, Jesus tells one of the greatest stories ever, the Good Samaritan story. The Good Samaritan story was told in response to the question, who is my neighbor? You're telling me to go love my neighbor? Who is the neighbor? So Jesus tells a story about a Jew who goes from Jerusalem to Jericho. And on the way, robbers get a hold of him, take everything he has and hurt him and injure him and leave him lying there on the road. And on that way, comes a priest, a Sarian. First comes a priest. And he sees the guy, you know, laid down, injured and all that, bleeding, but he just goes right past him. Then second comes a Levite. Now these are big Jewish religious leaders. Purposely, Jesus is constructing the story like this. And the Levite also sees this man's pitiful condition, but he just passes by. And then third comes a Samaritan. Now the Samaritan... As you know, Samaritans are enemies of the Jews. They are like, you know, they hate each other, the Jews and the Samaritans. But the Samaritan sees this Jew in, you know, like this lying on the road, bleeding and so on, and has pity on him, compassion, Jesus says. He had compassion on him and he went and tended to his wounds and he took him and carried him and took him to the inn, you know, the place where they could treat him and admitted him there and paid some money and said, keep this for his treatment and I'll come back. If it costs more, I'll give you that. And he went away. And then Jesus looks at the guy and said, you asked me who's the neighbor, right? Well, now you know. What's the point? The neighbor is anyone who's in need, even your enemy. The Samaritan demonstrated that. <laughs> He looked at the Jew as his neighbor and went and helped him. And then Jesus is turning the story on to the guy and saying, if a Samaritan can love you as neighbor, surely you can love him and anybody else like him as neighbor. 
That is neighbor is anyone who is in need. Neighbor is anyone who is in need, even enemies. <laughs> that's the point. Doesn't exclude anybody and that's why he told the story like that. So, love your neighbor as yourself. So, neighbor is anyone who is in need. We are told by Jesus to love the neighbor as our self. As our self. Everybody say, as ourselves. That's a very interesting way to put it, right? Love your neighbor as your self. Jesus assumes that we love ourselves. The command is not to love yourself. He didn't say, love yourself. No, love your neighbor as your self. He simply assumes that you love your self. We do love ourselves, don't we? Jesus takes it for granted that we love ourselves. We do. That's the truth. For example, we want good things for ourselves. We do whatever is in our power to get it. We want things for ourselves and we do whatever is in our power to get it. For example, when we're hungry, we want food to fill our stomach. And we'll do anything to get it. Because we get hangry, as they say. Hungry plus angry, you know. If you meet a person like that, give him the food first. And talk later. We'll do anything to get food. We want it and we'll do anything to get it. Food, not only food, but clothes, place to live, protection, security, in times of danger. All these things, are they bad? Is it bad to want it? No. These desires are put within by God himself. You know, why do you get hungry? God made us like that. It's not wrong to desire these things. It's not wrong to do whatever you can to get it. There's nothing wrong in that. Jesus doesn't say, don't love yourself, go love that person. No, love your neighbor as your self. So, since no man ever hated his own flesh, Ephesians 5, 29, but nourishes it and cherishes it. So, in general, people love themselves. <laughs> Maybe there are exceptions. Maybe sometimes people, due to very bad backgrounds, experiences, abuse or something like that. Maybe they're in extreme cases, they may hate themselves. And even in those cases, mostly, they at least want food for themselves. They want their pain to reduce. They want their happiness to increase. There is a basic love for themselves. While the world likes to say, love yourself, love yourself, love yourself, love yourself. The Bible doesn't emphasize that. It says instead, love your neighbor as your self. That is, you want something good for you and you'll go and do anything to get it, fine. Want the same for your Neighbor, just like you want something good, want something good for them also. <laughs> just like you'll do anything to get it, be willing to help them <laughs> to get it. Do whatever is in your power to help them to get it. <laughs> Isn't that what it says? Do you realize how radical that is? Love your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> this is radical. So it's very difficult to do. I don't want you to miss this. Loving God and loving neighbor, the way Jesus says it is very difficult. If you're hungry, not only satisfy your hunger, think of the other person who's hungry and do what you can to satisfy their hunger. If you have a lot of pain, not only try to reduce your pain, think of the others in pain and do what you can to reduce their pain. If you want your life to have meaning and purpose, then not only go after that and pursue that, but think of the others who are living pointlessly, <laughs> meaninglessly, and pursue meaning and satisfaction for them. So seek the good that you want for others, but not only that, seek it in the same way that you seek your good. <laughs> Seek it to the same level that you seek your good. Do you see what he's saying? Not only, okay, I want food, I want clothes, I want shelter, I want protection, I want meaning, satisfaction, happiness in life, less pain, more happiness. And so, okay, want the same things for your neighbor. No, it's not just that. The level to which I want these things and go after these things, you go help your neighbor do get it. That's what he's saying. Because love involves action. When he says it in the Good Samaritan story, there is action. The one who loved acted. Right? He felt compassion and acted. Notice everything is there. The compassion is there. The action is there. Do you see what I mean? That is, love your neighbor as yourself means want good things for them. 
help them get it but want it to the same degree that you want it for yourself <laughs> not just want the same things it's more than that want it to the level that you want it for yourself desire their good to the level that you desire your own good and pursue their good to the level you would pursue your good this is a radical command this is a radical command and if you were to ask me how do you apply this practically the bible would say you know try to do it in concentric circles first pay attention to who's close to you your family take care of your own family love your neighbor as yourself should be first practiced in the home <laughs> your nearest neighbor is your husband or wife <laughs> your children <laughs> so you love your neighbor as yourself in the home in your earthly family your christian family your brothers and sisters and then the next circle maybe would be the world <laughs> strangers in the world or you know people you know in the world maybe the last circle would be enemies <laughs> but this is very hard isn't it what do you think but it's so important that you do it and that's the second part of the uh, thing i wanted to say eh? the first part is we saw what it is what is the most important thing love god but jesus had second also love neighbor is so hard but it's so important to do this it's so important to do this and i add this as a point because this passage emphasizes it three times that it's important to do this it's important to do this yeah look at the three times it emphasizes it verse 31 the end of verse 31 after saying this is the first commandment second command jesus then finishes with these words verse 31 ends with there is no other commandment greater than these no other commandment greater than nothing more important nothing more important for you to do in life than these that's the meaning think about that no greater obligation you have in your life love god love neighbor like this that's the first time it's emphasized the second time it's emphasized the scribe emphasizes it jesus emphasizes then the scribe emphasizes in verse 32 verse 33 the scribe replies you know amazing reply he affirms everything jesus said in verse 32 look at the scribe's reply you are right he affirms everything jesus said but he modifies one thing he changes he adds one thing to what jesus said i want you to notice that the scribe said to jesus you're right teacher you are right you have truly said that the lord is one and there is no one besides him and to love him with all the heart all the understanding all the strength love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices did, did you notice that that last line jesus never said <laughs> Jesus said it in a general way no other commandment is greater than these now this guy he took that and he affirmed everything Jesus said he said you're right and then he adds this he says in fact the love commandment you're talking about is even greater than all the sacrifices the burnt offerings and all the other sacrifices do you realize how how radical forgive me for using the word again but it is for a scribe standing in the temple courts where they are making sacrifice after sacrifice to say the love commandment that you just said is more important than all the sacrifices put together the burnt offering he mentions specifically the burnt offering was the most important maybe sacrifice leviticus begins with burnt offering leviticus chapter 1 burnt offering you supposed to bring an animal and offer it as a whole burnt offering the entire animal must be burnt on the altar offered up to god to remove sin and so on all the burnt offerings all the sacrifices put together love commandment is more important more important to do this than that that's the implication now that's that's an amazing statement for a scribe to say a jewish scribe is saying like this how come how did he say that and and what did he mean by it well how did he say it is because there are many old testament verses like it probably they came to his mind <laughs> there are many old you know believe it or not people think you know all the good teaching is only in the new testament that's wrong <laughs> jesus pulled out the greatest commandment from the old testament deuteronomy 65 and leviticus 1918 love your neighbor as yourself was not a new testament idea it's an old testament idea he pulled it right out of there and even what the scribe says there are a lot of similar verses like that in the old testament i'll read just maybe a couple of samples hosea 6 6 hosea 6 6 
I desire mercy and not sacrifice, God says. I desired mercy, not sacrifice. The knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Or Amos chapter 5 verse 22. Huh? Though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard for peace offerings of your fat beasts, the fat of your beasts. It is. God is the one who told, come and bring the burnt offering and offer it. Now he's saying, I will not accept it. <laughs> What's happening here? God only said, Leviticus 1, come and give the burnt offering. Very important. Now God is saying, I won't accept it. What happened is by the time these prophets are writing, Hosea or Amos, what has happened is Israel has forsaken Yahweh. Started worshipping other gods, disobeying Yahweh's commandments. No morality in the land, no justice in the land. Leviticus 19 which says, love your neighbor as yourself has specific directions. When you harvest your field, make sure you leave the corners so that the poor in your area can come and eat. Think about them. They didn't care about the poor. Israel got to the point where they stopped caring about the poor. They started oppressing the poor. But if you ask them, their attitude was, but we're doing the rituals, the sacrifices. We have the temple, God is there in the temple, and we are doing all the sacrifices. Not one sacrifice is missed. It became a very audacious kind of attitude. That is, their confidence is, we can do whatever we want, just offer the sacrifices. It's not like they're repenting and feeling remorse and saying, God, we've sinned, we're sorry, you know, we did not love the poor. We oppressed the poor. We went after other gods. Forgive us, Lord. Please accept this sacrifice. Forgive our sin. They didn't come like that. They came saying, oh, let's offer the sacrifice and we'll be fine, you know. Temple's here, God is here, sacrifice is here. We can do whatever we want. God is saying, no, I don't want your sacrifice. Keep it for yourself. Do what I say in Amos. He says in verse 24, let judgment run down like waters. Let righteousness as a, run down as a mighty stream. Pay attention to justice and righteousness in the land. Don't just ignore. You don't think you can ignore everything I say and disrespect my word and my commands and then just come and say, you know, oh, here I offer the sacrifice and did the rituals and the rites. It applies even to uh, praising God with song. Verse 23, Amos 5, I'm, I'm looking at that passage, Amos 5, 23 says, take away from me the noise of your songs. I don't want your singing, he says, because you fellows, you don't care about my words, <laughs> but you come and you sing and you make music. I will not hear the melody of your viols. <laughs> I don't want your music, I don't want your singing, I don't want your sacrifice because you disrespect me and my words. What he was saying is, empty, right, and ritual. This happens sometimes even today. People think just because they go to church or you know, participate in important rites, rituals, uh, baptism, communion, you know, whatever this, that, you know, they don't have to pay attention to what God is saying. No, no. God cannot be mocked. See, if a person would come and, and repent and say, Lord, I'm sorry, I've sinned against you. Forgive me. That's different. This is not like that. And the guy saw that loving God, loving, it's so important to do this. This is more important than right and ritual. So here is the standard. And you know, Jesus uh, appreciates the guy. Did you see that verse 34? Jesus appreciates the guy for his answer. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, Jesus saw that he answered. I say all this to say, even though this is so difficult, what is so difficult? Loving God, loving neighbor is so difficult. It is so important to do. It's emphasized many, many times. Question again is, are we doing it? But let's move on to the third part here. We saw what it is, loving God and loving neighbor is the greatest obligation we have. We saw how important it is to do it. It's more important than right ritual. It's more important than anything else. Because actually Jesus says in another place, everything hangs on this. Everything hangs on. Have you seen that verse? Matthew 22, 40. Same incident in Matthew. Matthew 22, 40. Jesus says, after saying love God, love neighbor, he says, the law and the prophets, the whole law and prophets, meaning the whole Old Testament, hangs on this love command. The literal word is hangs there. That is everything 
is being supported by the love command. Everything is merely an outworking of the love commandment. Yes. Love God and love neighbor, but it's so difficult, but it's so important to do. Finally, knowing this much is not enough. Knowing this much is not enough. Knowing that this is the greatest obligation we have is not enough. Realizing what the scribe realized even is not enough. Look at verse 34. See, Jesus appreciated the scribe, but then he also put in this word. The last thing Jesus said to the scribe is this. Verse 34, Jesus saw that he answered wisely, said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. You are not far from the kingdom of God. Everybody say, not far. That's a strange thing to say, right? You are not far. Was he complimenting him or is it positive or negative? It's both. Not far means you've come closer, but you're not inside. You have come closer, but you're not inside. How has he come closer? He's come closer because for the first time he can see the great challenge that the law presents, the commandments of God presents. For the first time he can see the greatness of the obligation he has to God. See, the scribes and the Pharisees, they thought, you know, they can just take these commandments and just do and get by and manage and God will accept them and it'll be fine, you know. Ten Commandments, we've done it from our youth, they would say. But what Jesus does is, he says, everything depends on love. <laughs> you got to see the whole law in light of this. This is the most important. If you do everything, you miss this, you miss everything. If you do this, you'll do everything. If you fulfill the love command, you fulfill the whole law. If you do everything but you miss these two, you miss everything. You have not really kept anything. And so the scribe for the first time begins to see the greatness of the law. That it demands something very high. He's beginning to see it. That's why he's come closer. Why is he not inside? <laughs> He's not inside because he has not yet concluded that there is no way he can keep this command. <laughs> there is no way he can actually keep this command perfectly. He's not come to that conclusion yet, has he? No, if he had, you know what I mean? See, he came closer to the kingdom because for the first time he sees the great challenge that God presents. <laughs> but he's not come into the kingdom because he has not concluded that he can never meet this challenge. He can never do what God is asking him to do because it's an impossible challenge. What's an impossible challenge? Loving God and neighbor the way Jesus says here perfectly is impossible. Now, if you have not understood that, the whole point is missed. You see, Christianity is an impossible religion. It demands that we do the impossible. Jesus is always like that, you know. The standard that he puts up is so high. That can any man say, can they touch, put their hand on their chest and say, in all honesty, I have loved God like this. Can any man say, I have loved neighbor like this? I've loved them perfectly like this. Can the scribe say that? No. He hasn't realized that. If he had realized, he would have said, then what will I do? This is too difficult. Instead, he's giving pointers to Jesus. Yeah, it's even greater than the sacrifices. You know. What he should have then said is, then how will I ever be accepted by God? If the first command itself, I'm out. <laughs> how will I ever meet his, this obligation before God? How can I be saved? How can I be accepted by God since I have failed miserably? He should have said that, but he hasn't come that far. 
and we're not told in the passage whether he came further. Maybe he came further. All we're told is he's not far from the kingdom. Maybe there's somebody here. You're not far. <laughs> You've come closer. <laughs> You've begun to see the greatness of Christianity and the greatness of Christ's teachings. You've begun to see that this is far greater than anything else out there. That Christ puts up an ideal that is impossibly high. Love your enemies as yourself. Even. Maybe you've begun to see that. But that doesn't mean you're in, my friend. Have you come to the conclusion that there's no way you can actually do it? Have you? If you have not, then you have not even realized the glory of the law. <laughs> the law itself has a glory to it. The commandments of God itself have a glory to it. And if you have not realized the glory of the law, how will you ever realize the glory of the gospel? That is much higher. <laughs> because there is no man who has ever loved God with all his heart, soul, mind and strength and loved his neighbor as himself. The gospel says there came one 2,000 years ago, Jesus. He's the only one who loved God with all his heart, all his soul, all his mind, all his strength. <laughs> He's the only one who did it and loved his neighbor, who? Us as himself, actually more than himself. He had life eternal and glory everlasting and yet he laid it all aside and came down, became a man and lived and suffered and died for us on the cross of Calvary. Why? Because we failed to keep God's law. What is sin, my friend? Sin is failing to love God. <laughs> failing to glorify God. Not only did we not love God, we actually loved everything else. <laughs> in the place of God, we put other things and people in his place and commit idolatry in that way. And then out of that comes every other sin. And for all our sins, the sinless one took the punishment on the cross of Calvary, died in our place, shed his blood, gave his life, and then rose again. And now salvation is offered free. The love of God is offered free. The saving love of God is offered free to anyone who would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You are not accepted by God because you do this commandment because if that was the case, you are finished. <laughs> you are accepted by God because Jesus did this commandment. On that basis, you are accepted. You are fully accepted. God showers you with his love, brings you into his family and says you are his child forever and nothing can ever separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Right? And then what? <laughs> Do we throw out this commandment? No. <laughs> That's the beauty. God always does more than we can imagine. He not only forgives us, pays the penalty for us violating this command, but then he says, now I'm going to actually help you to do this more and more. <laughs> we're not going to throw this out. In fact, for the first time, we're going to begin to fulfill it more and more. That's what happens in Romans 3, uh, Romans 13. Look just one verse, Romans 13, verse 8. Romans 13, verse 8. Oh, to no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Paul, Paul is taking that. <laughs> the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, not murder, not steal, not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this one word, you shall not, you shall love your neighbor as your. You see what Paul is doing? All the commandments, ten commandments, they're summed up in this one word. He says, you shall love your neighbor as your self. Because if you love your neighbor as yourself, you'll keep the second table, last six commandments. If you really love your neighbor as yourself, that means you are loving God, because otherwise you can't love your... <laughs> Neighbor, if you love your neighbor, you'll fulfill the law. And he says, that's what you need to do. Verse 8, owe no one anything except to love each other. You will always owe love. 
he will always owe. That's a debt you can never fully pay. <laughs> but interesting, that debt is different. You pay some debt, right? It gets lesser and lesser. But uh, when you give more and love, it increases, love increases. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> when you spend money, you lose. When you spend love, it grows, it increases. <laughs> So Christians everywhere are now asked to love God and love your neighbor as your self. But the only way to do it is first realize you can't do it and then go to God empty handed like a child and say, Lord, I need your help. That's what this guy is missing here. That's why he's not far, but he's not in. What's the point of coming close and not coming inside? The difference between getting on the train and not getting on the train is one step There's no point. Where are you? Are you close or are you inside today? I can take a good guess that there is somebody here who's close but not inside. What's the point of being close? You may be close and I appreciate you for that. I congratulate you for that. It's better to be close than far. But if you never get in, then close is of no use. May God bring you in. May God help you to take that step. What is that next step? That is to put your faith in the Lord Jesus and what he did for you. And it is his blood, it is his righteousness on the basis of which God accepts you fully and loves you eternally and changes you from the inside out, pours his love out into you and you begin to love him and love others better for the first time. And you grow as a believer. Let's all stand up. I pray for those who are not inside. I pray for those who are not inside. If that is you, you need to ask God. Only God can help you take that final step. Put your faith in the Lord Jesus. And I pray for those who are inside that we would see that God is in the business of changing our hearts, pouring his love in so that we can actually begin to do this commandment more and more and begin to actually begin living somewhere close to this and grow in this. For as we grow in our sense of God's love, we will grow in loving him back and surely we will grow in loving neighbor. Lord, help us, Lord. Pour out your love. Let the Holy Spirit shed abroad in our hearts the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And draw us to yourself, Lord. Draw our hearts to you, Lord, our minds to you, our soul, our strength itself. Help us to love you like that more and more and help us to love our neighbor as ourself, Lord. This is so difficult, but Lord, with your help, we can do. You want us to do, we have to do, there is no other go. And you will help us and you will change the world through us is what we believe. That is what you want. Let your will be done, let your name be glorified. Through this, we bless your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with us for now and forevermore. Amen.